Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. How much has changed in the last year? I think it was last Christmas, the number one app downloaded Christmas morning on all the app stores was the Fitbit app because everyone had got these trackables and wanted to track their heart rate, their steps, and were competing against their colleagues in meeting rooms every day ever since. And this Christmas, it looks like Coinbase is going to be the number one app on the App Store as everyone becomes obsessed with cryptocurrencies. And when I always ask you guys to email me questions, that's probably the number one email I'm getting from you all at the moment. Neil, how do I buy uh, cryptocurrencies? How do I buy this coin? How do I sign up? What platform is the best to sign up to? As I always say, Please keep those emails coming in. I really don't mind helping out you listeners and helping point you in the direction. And if you do invest, invest sensibly. And most importantly of all, never, ever buy into anything that you don't understand just because everybody else is doing it. Because that FOMO thing is no good to anyone, believe me. But hey, this is not a cryptocurrency podcast. I've digressed a little bit there. Uh, Today, I wanted to talk about a recent summit, which was called the Powering Precision Health Summit. Essentially, Powering Precision Health is about transforming reactive sick care, where we all just wait for something to go wrong and then go see the doctor, to a more proactive health care. And we're using technology to do this now. But like I said a few moments ago, we can track everything now from our blood pressure, steps, diet, exercise, and so much more. But at Precision Health, they're also bringing our environment into the equation. I don't think we consider enough just how much our own environment and where we live affects our health and affects our stress levels. So buckle up, hold on tight, because I'm going to beam your ears all the way to the Greater Boston area so we can speak with Kevin Hurofsky, who is the founder and chairman of Powering Precision Health. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Kevin. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are? And what you do? Sure. My name's uh, Kevin Rosofsky, and I um, I'm currently the uh, chairman CEO of a company called Quanterix. I serve on a whole lot of disruptive technology boards, and I founded a, a summit called Powering Precision Health a couple years ago, that's focused on transforming healthcare by basically shifting from the treatment of disease, which is still very important, and we know we can personalize that and and get much better with precision medicine, but also we'd like to shift that treatment into actual, I'll call it early detection and actual prevention of the disease. And so this summit is a combination of better ways to make more personalized precision treatments, but also incredibly new disruptive ways to see diseases very early in their cascades when they're very treatable and changing the game of understanding the environmental factors that really are triggering the disease at a molecular level. That's been a a major breakthrough is the ability to see how different environmental factors, whether it be the lack of sleep, whether it be sunlight and radiation, whether it be smoking, lack of exercise, eating growth hormones, pesticides, sugars in your diets, all of these are considered, even concussions are considered environmental factors. And so for the first time, this summit is actually looking at how those environmental factors are impacting the body and and then teaching us new ways to prevent disease in the first place. So it's a pretty comprehensive summit that uh, has been pretty profoundly um, advancing this whole field over the last couple of years. And and that's an area that I'm, um, you know, very excited about. And it really does seem that this summit is actually changing the game. It's essentially uh, establishing a new paradigm for healthy living, all by fostering collaboration among the world's foremost doctors, researchers, scientists, innovators, investors, and even policymakers who all together can actually collaborate and work together to transform healthcare. But for anyone listening that's new to this kind of world, can you just expand on that a little and help the listeners understand what a difference this collaboration will actually make? Yeah, you know, one of the most important learnings I've had over the years as we try to get disruptive technologies to actually help patients and to help the world, you find a whole lot of entrenched profitability in the industries and in the world that get in the way of advancements. And there's a lot to lose by these entrenched profitabilities and these businesses that are today making a lot of money, sometimes at the expense of health, believe it or not. And so, 
we really feel a movement is necessary. That's why all the different constituencies you mentioned are necessary to really go after this. It's not just the scientists coming up with a disruptive way to be able to see Alzheimer's five to 10 years before dementia in the blood or to be able to see pancreatic cancer maybe six to nine months before it can be seen today when it can still be surgically uh, treated or to be able to see the role that concussions or sugar are playing in the body and creating disease. It's not enough just for the scientists to come up with a way to do that it's actually very important to have the advocates that really benefit from these advances right there with you to inspire and actually block those that might get in the way of that commercialization advancement. And so having the patient advocates there, um, having Susan Coleman Foundation and their medical staff, for instance, if we have a, a new blood-based test for breast cancer that would be better than the mammogram, significantly better, more precise, and less invasive without any radiation, there could be folks that would lose by that advancement occurring. Um, today, it's a four or five billion dollar industry for mammograms, as an example, and we think it's one of the worst tests out there. And there's absolutely opportunities to advance new ways of doing this. But just coming up with the idea is one thing, and then getting it you know, to be accepted, adopted, and put into practice sometimes requires you to move those that are in the way of the traditional way of doing it, get them out of the way. And that's why you need policymakers sometimes involved as well, not just the patient advocates. So, you know, our movement really is looking at the most lethal diseases today. It's looking at better ways to treat those diseases with better medications. The fourth leading cause of death by the way, in the United States is just side effects to drugs. And so the toxicity of drugs is really an incredibly challenging piece of treatment today. So coming up with drugs that aren't as toxic and have a better efficacy would be one way to, to improve today's state of care. But we want to go beyond that. We want to then get into understanding how growth hormones and antibiotics and all the pesticides, for instance, that are in the food chain how those are triggering breast cancer in the first place and seeing if we can now start to create policies to actually reverse some of the environmental factors that's caused life expectancy in the United States to actually be declining. If you're born today in the United States, you actually will have a shorter life expectancy than your parents, primarily because of obesity and a lot of the addictions that we have today for sugars. It's another example where we know the food industry has looked at combinations of fat, sugar, and salt to create almost the, the ability that you can't eat just one and creates almost an addiction. And, and so now two-thirds of the United States are overweight or obese. And we actually have a lot of molecular data now linking that obesity and overweight condition to cancers being triggered and cancers being fed, as well as heart disease. And so we all know growing up, our parents have said, you know, eat your vegetables and get a good night's sleep. But for the first time, we're now able to look inside the body with these technologies that have been around for about five years to digitize the biomarkers and really understand at a molecular level what we're doing to the body. And we think that evidence, that scientific evidence, with a lot of validated peer review uh, publications behind that evidence is going to really help the movement. And that's uh, why people that come to this summit were so inspired by the level of sophistication of the science that we brought forth with the major thought leaders in the world presenting the science that's all been peer-reviewed and published. There's over 6,500 6, peer-reviewed publications um, that were behind the 55 speakers that we had. And then we went right after all these other components like the patient advocates, the policymakers, the commercializers, the regulators. How can we move these, these forward? Because there's so much money being made today in the treatment of disease. Sometimes it's not as easy to prevent the disease and create a lot of excitement for the technologies that can prevent it. And that's why we feel movement's necessary. And, and you know, that's what I'm all about. I, I retired really, you know, four or five years ago having commercialized and sold a lot of really good companies and businesses that help patients and came out of retirement when I saw the possibilities of these newer technologies to truly transform the way medicine's practiced. 
Now, preventative measures are always going to be better than any cure, but can you also tell me about your belief that accelerating precision medicine is also the key to changing our current healthcare system and ultimately improving the longevity of the population? No doubt about it. I mean, even today, we estimate in the United States that 25% of the country suffers from depression. And today, it's such a vague area of subjective dialogue between a neurologist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist and the patient to try to get to the basis. And what we're finding is that every person is different. And so one great area of an example to hit exactly what you just described is We've discovered now about 15 different neurobiomarkers where we can look inside of a non-invasive blood test and see the health of the brain and to understand what might be triggering some of the depression. And so there's a study we're doing for one of the top five pharma companies right now where they have a thousand blood samples from patients that are incredibly happy. They've got a thousand blood samples from patients that are very depressed and potentially even suicidal. They have a thousand patients that have blood, uh, they've got got blood from, um, they have high anxiety, they might even be post-Iraq war veterans that might have post-traumatic stress disorder, but a lot of anxiety. And so the idea then would be to look at all those blood samples and to look at all these neuromarkers that you can now see in blood and see what the differences are in these various categories. And then ultimately what it does then is creates almost the ability, I don't know if you've heard this navigation technology called Waze or Google Maps yeah. where you can navigate through very carefully all the different you know obstacles, whether it be traffic, whether it be wrecks, whatever it is. Well, we think we can build the ways of the body for, say, neurology, where now a drug maker can actually try to traverse these biomarkers and use the at least amount of drug necessary to move the biomarkers to where they should be based on all of this new evidence that we have and the correlations of these biomarkers with different states of brain health. And so they try to minimize the dose because they want to minimize the side effects toxicity of the drug. And we also have all these biomarkers that can measure the toxicity of the drug. And so we can actually look at the immune system and understand whether or not the immune system is being perturbed negatively. One of the biggest issues right now with drug toxicity is what's called autoimmune issues where the drug is creating some benefit, but then it triggers an autoimmune response. And maybe the immune system gets upregulated and and starts to eat the body and create a lot of uh, issues for toxicity in that regard, or it gets downregulated and allows infection to, to invade the body. So there's all kind of ways now that you can use these technologies, digital biomarkers, to actually navigate the body and create a drug that's safe and effective. And so That area is exploding with excitement. Um, I mentioned neurology, but the same thing is going on in cancer, particularly when you're trying to use the immune system with the new, um, you know, we'll call them the um, uh, immuno-oncology drugs. You're trying to upregulate to kind of have an anti-PDL1 effect like Keytruda might have, but you might over overstimulate the immune system and create a cytokine storm and, and, and create a major issue for that patient. So how you get the drug to have the appropriate efficacy is going to be different for each patient depending on their immune system. And so personalizing it is another big strategy the drug industry is using, and they're using this Quantarix technology to also be able to measure and, and recruit patients into their trials. And so if they want a new indication for a drug, they can stratify the patient population that into a very certain category of protein biomarkers that really that drug will work for very effectively and very safely. And so that's another major area of strategy today is is running drug trials in order to get the right patient, the right drug at the right moment that won't have the toxicity that that you have. And and this is a big area of opportunity because drugs only work at best half, half the time. And, and cancer maybe only 25% of the time. And many, like I said, the fourth leading cause of death in the United States is toxicity to drugs. And so this is a big issue, and this is a huge opportunity to improve treatments. And so that's a big area of focus in this whole Powering Precision Health Summit. But again, um, while that's a great area, we also like to look at ways to prevent.
So essentially then, you believe that the next iteration of precision medicine is actually precision health, isn't it? No question. You know, I, I, I really coined um, this phrase precision health from the standpoint that I got worried that we were so focused on precision medicine representing the treatment as opposed to the prevention. And so that's why we're calling it precision health. And so we look at the Fitbit today or the Apple uh, watch where there's a lot of metrics is that you're watching the health of the person. Someday we want to get this interacting with the biomarkers in the blood so you really will have a complete management of your health. And that's what we mean by precision health. The ability to see health has been a major challenge for the world. We can see disease and typically we can only see disease after there are symptoms. The ability to see a disease very early, maybe six to nine months before symptoms, as we mentioned in pancreatic cancers or the you know breast cancers or lung cancers or Alzheimer's, the ability to see these disease cascades long before symptoms present non-invasively is what the newer technologies are enabling. And so what we really are wanting to do is unleash that ability to see these diseases much earlier and these technologies, by the way, are the equivalent of being able to see a grain of sand in 2,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's how sensitive they've become on the protein. And they can actually differentiate um, a, an equivalent of a blade of grass in a field the size of Alaska. So this is true rocket science being applied to the blood. And it's all really been advanced really in the last few years. And there's now been 700 uh, trials by drug makers, phase one, phase two, phase three, using these technologies to create a much safer and effective drug. So, you know, um, I really applaud the movement and the way in which these drug makers have been inspired by the technology and, and the adoption has been unprecedentedly quick. I think um, 17 of the top 21 pharma companies have uh, the technology now, and many of them have multiple platforms. And again, running a lot of these trials. And there's nearly 200 peer-reviewed publications now just on these digital biomarkers from Quanteric. So I think that this is the, the way um, we can really start to be proactive in designing drugs for the future that are personalized. And then that could team up with the ability to, to keep yourself healthy by prevention with the biomarkers. And that whole field then becomes the field of precision health as opposed to precision medicine. Now, you mentioned at the beginning of the show about the effects of pesticides and things in our food and toxins in the air. I mean, what impact do you think the environment actually has on our health? Do you think we underestimate that? I, I think that um, there's a lot of studies in the area of oncology that would suggest that the, the role of environmental factors is more of, a, um, of an impact on triggering the cancer than what you're born with. And so, you know, we have a lot of identical twins that are born with the same genes. One grows up to get breast cancer, the other grows up to get diabetes. And, and the reason is, is the way they live their lives. And so the ability now to see the protein cascade, which is a much more relevant cascade than the gene itself. The gene can tell you the predisposition of disease. If you have the BRCA mutations and you're a woman, you would get very concerned that you're going to be a high um, candidate for getting breast cancer, but that doesn't mean you're going to get it. And so there's ways you can live your life to absolutely minimize the chances of you ever getting it. And that's the, the key here is, is that there's evidence in some disease categories that 80% of the disease is more related to what you expose your body to versus what you're born with. And so even if you're born with really bad hereditary disease, you have a shot um, of, of preventing it. And, and I think this is the, the whole exciting part of, of the, the process we're in right now is, is the ability to truly look at this, even concussions. You know, that was something that probably five years ago, I, I look at concussions for brain health or concussions leading to all early Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I look at concussions being almost like smoking was for lung cancer. People looked at smoking at one time and didn't understand its correlative impact on lung cancer or heart disease. I think there's now mounting evidence that concussions, particularly repetitive concussions and sometimes subconcussive blows that you don't even have symptoms from, 
they have an accumulated dosing effect on the body and help trigger many of these diseases. The antibiotics that are in the food chain today, there's a lot of evidence that it's starting to deteriorate our microbiome in our stomach, and that is affecting our overall immune system. And so there's now beginning to see evidence that the microbiome being damaged by these antibiotics could be triggering immune disorders, and some of them are even now being linked into um, neuro diseases. So even Alzheimer's, um, some are now seeing evidence that they may be getting triggered by immune issues. And so the concussions is one environmental factor in that area. Another is sleep. Um, there's mounting evidence that if you don't get sleep and you don't dream, that you're not allowing the toxic proteins to go through the blood brain barrier at night and be cleared from your body. And so there's mounting now data around these protein biomarkers that are toxic that need to get cleared from your cerebral spinal fluid. And what we've been learning is the blood brain barrier expands at night when you're dreaming particularly, and that allows those proteins to pass through the blood brain barrier into the blood and out the liver. So these are examples of environmental factors that can have a profound effect on health. And now we've got the machine and the data and the approach and a lot of scientists very inspired and fired up looking at all these different categories. I'm personally going to be on a paper with a guy from NYU Langone. He's one of the top researchers in the world, um, Moni, um, for Alzheimer's. And he's the one uh, – we're doing these sleep um, disorder type tests to see if you can recover quicker from a concussion or, or head traumas if you have – good sleep and release the toxic proteins? Can you avoid um, some of the higher risk of Alzheimer's, early Alzheimer's, because you have sleep disorders? Can we prove now molecularly um, some of, you know, how sleep itself can be an environmental factor? So very exciting um, field that's allowing us to see in the body in a way we never could see before. So what do you think of these te technological advancements that can track environments' uh, impact on our health in real time now? Are, and are there any solutions that particularly stand out to you? Well, you know, I, I think the Fitbit and the Apple Watch are clearly advancing down these paths. And what we're learning is most of the, the large reference labs and even the diagnostic companies are starting to say what we've done in the past was we could see disease but we couldn't see health. And these new digital biomarks are allowing the industry to now see health as well as disease. And, and when you can see both health and disease, any movement from the baseline health starts to say that you're moving to disease. And so I think that the digital biomarkers, the molecular digital biomarkers, I call them the variables of life. The fact that we can now see them, protein particularly excites me, even though there's a lot of role for DNA, RNA, and microRNA, which the newer technologies from Quanterix are going to be able to, to see those as well with the same level of sensitivity that you could see them before with PCR without having to use PCR. So you eliminate a lot of the biasnesses that PCR creates. My view is, is that that field of molecular biomarkers is the field that will be the focus for the next 10 years. I think you're going to see major advances um, in that category. And one of the things we do with Pyrene Precision Health is we, not, we, we don't only um, invite all the scientists that are using the technologies for these innovations and the innovators that invented them. We don't only um, invite the, the patient advocates that really can benefit from it and the regulators and the policymakers that can support that, but we also invite investors, people that might have trauma in their own lives somehow that might be you know, high wealth individuals that want to go after, let's say, some of these um, post-traumatic stress disorders. We had one very wealthy person that um, his son was a veteran from Iraq. And so this person's invested like $150 million trying to improve brain health. Um, so my view here is, is that we want the folks that can help bring financial support to some of this movement. We want them to hear this as well, because they are the ones that can actually move the needle and accelerate research and development and get these technologies to patients sooner. So that's why we see this as a movement. It's, it's a collective village of all of the different constituencies that are needed to truly move the needle. And, and, and I think it's you know an exciting moment for this whole area of digital biomarkers. Now, hey, you know, you know, exercise and heart rate and blood pressure and glucose levels. Some of those traditional metrics is the more evidence we can be bringing in, into our daily life of the environmental factors role in affecting those metrics is, 
absolutely. I'm a big believer in all of that. Even sleep. Um, I watched today on uh, Good Morning. It wasn't Good Morning America. It was a Today Show. Or one, one of them. They were talking about um, the amount of sleep they've been getting per night and the linkages to Alzheimer's. And they were wearing watches to measure for the last week how much sleep they're actually getting. And it's causing them to now look for new ways, whether it be a, new, a better mattress or meditation or whatever, to improve that metric because of the linkage that there is now with Alzheimer's. I think, you know, more of that we can bring to the consumer or the person itself. We're empowering precision health. And that's really, maybe we change, instead of powering precision health, maybe it should be called empowering precision health because we want to get the control of your destiny, your health destiny, in your own hands. And these new tools, I think, are removing it from needing to have a doctor teaching you all this it's allowing you to take control of your own health journey. And that's empowering the individual to, to take control of their health and make sure that if they have children and they're playing soccer or they're playing uh, some other kind of sport, make sure they're not moving their neuromarkers negatively and creating downstream a lot of depression or anxiety. And so wherever you look in the world, we think that it's going to be an opportunity to, to take control of the future health of, of the individual, whether it be yourself, whether it be your family. And these new tools are incredibly exciting. And after, after reading the summit and how it unveiled groundbreaking approaches to prevention and early diagnosis and next treatments, do you think that we're actually approaching a more proactive than re- reactive approach to healthcare, where traditionally we used to wait till there was something go wrong, wait for those symptoms, and then go to the doctors, whereas now we're preventing it, aren't we? So we did one more thing, um, Neil, that I think it was really game-changing. We invited um, media to come to powering precision health and they came from all walks we had business reporters we had sports reporters because of the concussion in the nfl and all the things that we're doing there to try to support uh in the more public way you know the the whole effort around concussions and ct etc so we had all these reporters come and instead of having them just report on what was going on we actually formed some panels and i i moderated them and I wanted to ask them about fake news and, and the role that fake news can have in really setting back a movement. And so um, you might recall Theranos was a, a diagnostic company that was getting incredible levels of attention. And they were on the front cover talking about tra- changing medicine to allow people to go into a pharmacy with the finger prick, um, get some blood and then really take control and empower their life. That vision that Elizabeth Holmes had in my mind was incredible, but there wasn't sufficient um, platform technology underneath of it to allow it to really materialize and to be realized. And so my view was like, hey, was there some fake news reporting here that got everybody so hyped up? And then when it wasn't successful, we all took a, you know, a couple steps back and let's talk through that so that when we're reporting on concussions and we're reporting on CTE, when we're reporting on these new biomarker opportunities, let's make sure we don't set ourselves up to go backwards. And boy, I tell you, those panels were so enlightening because the key thing it showed was, and that's a lot of what we're trying to do with Pyrene Precision Health, is to use peer-reviewed scientific publications where you have a lot of peer scientists that look at the studies and they themselves troubleshoot them and are are devil's advocate to what was evolved and they only let it be published if it passes that review board. And so we actually um, had, I think I mentioned earlier, 6,500 peer reviewed publications behind the 55 speakers that came. And so I actually think that's another example where it's an exciting field, but if we let the news get ahead of what the actual reality is, we could actually hurt the movement. And so we want to make sure we pace it with really credible scientists that are supporting it. And then we inspire that pace based on the realities of what those publications are showing. So I think it's a, a formula that we've used in the past that if you keep it all balanced like that, you really can create a movement that's credible and will affect the world in our lifetime. And that's my goal. You know, I'm 56 now and, and I'm getting up there. And so I, I think that for the next generations, we got a shot here to really eliminate a lot of pain and suffering of the young. You, you watch the epidemic of brain cancer alone right now and just how much CAT scans are going into the brain, which has 100 times more radiation 
than a chest x-ray. And, and it only really reveals for the neurologist about 8% of the time any positive knowledge around what really the CAT scan has shown. And so we had a lot of neurologists there saying we really need to augment this with some blood biomarkers to start to really understand brain health and make sure that the testing itself isn't triggering the cancers. Because there's now some studies that show that there's 29 thousand brain cancers annually just in the United States being triggered from the overuse of CAT scans. And so, again, we want to look at this holistically and make sure we don't get ahead of the game and we only allow reporting to occur when it's been peer reviewed and is credible. So when it comes to your grand vision for the future of healthcare and the role that technology is going to play in that, I mean, how long do you th- or how far off do you think we are from doctor will instantly know uh, daily blood pressure, heart rate, weight, exercise, all from these um, devices that will be able to map out trends straight away from the second you walk into the doctor's surgery. Part of what has really frustrated me but still inspired me, and I actually dressed up as Steve Jobs at the inaugural event (laughs) at PPH, I guess, two years ago, and I came out and I said, you know, basically, I held up the iPhone and I said, look what we have been able to achieve in the last 10 years when we've really had a concerted effort on what the iPhone can now do and this whole mobility of the cloud and, and this evolution that's occurred just about in every industry. And I looked at that and I said, a lot of this is for entertainment value and it's a little embarrassing that we have 12 year olds dying down the street of geoblastoma where we probably could have seen those cancers at, you know, if, if the same level of innovation had gone into these digital biomarkers and digital imaging and different approaches and new medicines. And so to me, Um, We have an opportunity to inspire that same level of innovation and that revolution of innovation in this area that we're now describing of precision health. And so I think that you're going to see an advancement very rapidly. And if you just look at the sponsors that we had for Powering Precision Health, we had Pfizer, we had LabCorp, we had BioRad. You know, these companies um, are very focused on the next generation of seeing health as well as seeing disease and treating it. And we had 18 different sponsors step up. And to me, that's an indication that there's a new belief system around the ability to prevent disease and treat them much more effectively and safely. And it's time for us to, to, to make that a movement. And the new mobility of taking the digital world and applying it here, I think you may have point of care systems within the next 36 months that are going to start to apply to many of these blood biomarkers. And so having the Abbots of the world and the Roches so fired up and linked into what we're doing in this further tell me that we're now crossing the chasm for rapid advancement. So I would predict in the next five years, it'll be a revolutionary opportunity to to implement and transform sick care to health care instead of treating the sick truly turn it into healthcare, And that's the whole focus of Pyron Precision Health. And so I'm hoping in 2018, I think our summit is going to be in September. It's a two-day summit. I'm hoping that we get Joe Biden. I'm hoping that we get some of the biggest names that are trying to fix different parts of the, the healthcare system. And Joe's been very focused on Moonshot. Um, our governor right here in, United, in uh, Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, has been very focused on digitized medicine. We really want to have all of that support and and linkage because the movement can really move quicker with that level of support. So we're going to do everything we can to kind of make that 2018 summit the biggest and most powerful yet and and hopefully have a couple thousand people attend. Fantastic. So if we've awoken the curiosity of the listener today, can you point them in the direction of your website, social channels, and also the best way of contacting your team if you've got any questions um, after listening to our conversation today? Because I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people. Absolutely. And I wish I knew my hash. I think it's Kevin Rosovsky is my Twitter handle. K-E-V-I-N-H-R-U-S-O-V-S-K-Y. Is there normally a dot, by the way, in Twitter? <laughs> it depends, but I can add that to your show notes. Don't worry. I'll uh, track you down and add that to the, the notes just so everyone yep. can hear. And then the other is pphsummit.com. That's the Powering Precision Health Summit.com. All the presentations from last year are all on there, videoed, so you can everyone can see that. Um, and then Quanterix is Quanterix.com, Q-U-A-N-T-E-R-I-X.com. Um, and so we would love to have you on my Twitter handle following, and we'll, we continue to provide updates as well as 
you know, accessing these websites. Fantastic. Well, a huge thank you for coming on today. I love the fact that you're using technology to inspire proactive rather than a reactive approach to healthcare, and that is the way forward. And you can save a lot of lives doing that, and that's inspirational on its own. So a big thank you for coming on. Our pleasure, Neil. I really appreciate what you're doing for the world, and thank you. A fantastic story here. I was also chatting to Kevin offline. He was telling me how he believes that the ability to track the environment's impact on our health is actually key to helping move the needle forward. But I was fascinated by his background too, because he grew up in a coal mining town. And from a very early age, he became fascinated with how environmental factors dictate our health. And then he went on to find how protein biomarkers can track a person's health as it changes over time, which can enable doctors to spot diseases before they even occur. And as a result, he's pushing forward this to to advance digital technologies that can actually measure these biomarkers in real time. To me, at least, I think it's fascinating that from a young age and his environment, he began to question things with his curious young mind. And now he's making a difference through technology. So although the Power Precision Health Movement represents the intersection of new technological capabilities and the latest medical research ushering in that new era of medicine, it's Kevin's upbringing, his surroundings, and how he is now transforming reactive sick care into proactive health care, which is quite inspirational to me. But hey, what, what do I know? What are your thoughts? As always, I throw this one back out to you. I had an email from a guy called Ted in Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago, and he said, when you say... I generally want you to email in. Do you really mean it? And (laughs) of course I do. I genuinely love speaking with you all, engaging with you all. And whenever I go out to conferences in the US or anywhere in the world, I always try and meet up with listeners there too, just to tear down that fourth wall, so to speak. So keep those emails coming in to techblogwriter at outlook.com or equally tweet me at Neil C. Hughes. But that's it for today's episode, so hopefully I will see you all tomorrow. I will be taking a head count, so make sure you do turn up. And all that's left for me to say is, until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.